Hello, and welcome to the CAP Today webinar for Wednesday, October 14th. I'm Bob McGonigal, the publisher of CAP Today, and I'll be your host and moderate a question and answer session today after our formal presentations. Today's webinar is entitled, Detection of Therapeutically Targetable Mutations in Non-Small Cell Lung Cancer, is there a one-size-fits-all, cell-free DNA test? This webinar is made possible by a special educational grant from Agena Bioscience, and we're very grateful for their support and their help in bringing this event to you today. Our speakers, and I'll say more about each in due course, are Dr. Ed Schuring, who's professor at the University Medical Center at Groningen, in the Netherlands, and Dr. Daryl Irwin, who's the Vice President for Scientific Affairs at Agena Bioscience. Uh, we're quite global today. Dr. Irwin is speaking to you from Australia. Dr. Schuring is speaking to you from the Netherlands. Before we begin, however, I want to share some housekeeping tips with you, as I usually do. Uh, we suggest you often refresh your browser that can be useful. Also, if you have any kind of technical problem with the website or with the audio, you've got live technical support throughout today's webinar. In the lower right-hand corner of your screen, you'll see a toll-free number, 888-364-8804. We have live attendance standing by at any time. Below the slide deck, you'll see a Q&A box, and you can also, in that box, type in any technical problems that you have, and you'll be immediately attended to. But, of course, the question and answer box is primarily for you in the audience to ask your questions of our very distinguished speakers or make your comments. And as I said in the beginning, after the formal presentations, I will triage those questions and comments and moderate a question and answer session with our distinguished presenters. I want you to know that we plan to post all the slides and audio of today's webinar on captodayonline.com in about a week. You'll see some follow-up email, so uh, I just wanted to alert you to that. It's quite legitimate. And finally, as always, I need to remind you that CAP Today does not endorse any products or services that may be named today in the webinar. Also, my own remarks are purely personal, not to be construed or taken as a policy of the CAP Today or the College of American Pathologists. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, and he'll have some help with his slides from a colleague here, so uh, that should be quite uh, interesting. A very distinguished uh, speaker today, Dr. Ed Schuring, is a clinical scientist in molecular pathology. He's a doctorate uh, professor of molecular oncologic pathology at the University of in the University Medical Center in Groningen in the Netherlands, a very distinguished institution. Dr. Schering. Thank you very much, uh, Bob, and thank you. Uh, good day, everybody, and um, I would like to take the opportunity to thank the, both the organizers as well as Agina for the opportunity to speak here today. As a clinical scientist, I'm responsible for uh, molecular diagnostics in the northern part of the Netherlands, and part of that is also to, uh, to introduce new technologies that can be applied in the clinical setting. And one of these is the use of liquid biopsy, as will be the subject of today. And I will uh, illustrate uh, the, the advantage, advantage that have been, have been going on in the field of non-small lung cancers. First slide shows you my disclosures for today. So, a little bit more than 15 years, one, five years ago, uh, there was a patient described uh, with lung cancer that, uh, that had, uh, was treated with targeted therapy, one of the first ones in lung cancer. Here's an example of a patient from our institution that on the left-hand slide shows a CT scan within the lung uh, area. Uh, you, uh, you see a lot of the tumor cells, cancer cells. 
Now, these patients were treated with EGF-targeted therapy. The tumor was EGF receptor mutation positive. And in six weeks, on the right-hand slide, most uh, of the tumor cells, of the cancer cells, were gone. So there's a very successful treatment was shown. In fact, even uh, shortly after starting the, uh, the targeted therapy, already you see a good response in these patients. Now, this was the basis of uh, an, a new change of strategy of treatment lung cancer patients uh, worldwide. In fact, we are not treating any more patients based on, on stage of disease or, or histological type using systematic treatments like chemotherapy or radiotherapy, but now we are switching gears to identify, to describe the molecular changes that occur in a tumor biopsy. And based on that information, we find the drug uh, that it's specifically targeting these, uh, these mutations. So we're moving into individual therapy, precision medicine, the definition of precision medicine. And we, working in pathology, uh, have the task to perform uh, this molecular diagnostics, so the molecular pathology. So this means uh, if we now go to, to, to look at what drugs that are available in the Netherlands nowadays for lung cancer patients, you, you can appreciate on this list here a long list of different, different targeted drugs that are available for the targets that are also indicated, like EGFR, BREF, etc., and the percentages indicate the, the frequencies of mutations in these genes that we found in the Dutch population. Oh, yeah, you can appreciate that this list is, is already quite large and it's growing. And this means that when we, uh, when we get a biopsy from, from the pulmonologist of a, of a um, metastasized lung cancer patient, we have to test for all these markers to get a molecular proof or profile, a complete profile, meaning that the test that we are doing at the moment uh, are uh, many genes, but also many technologies that we need to get this to complete molecular profile, including nitrogen sequencing, fluorescence hybridization, immunosogenistry, RNA-based technologies. All these kind of technologies have been done, have to be done on the patients. Now, uh, this is the, the, the list of genes, which is 13 genes in the Netherlands uh, in the guideline, the Dutch guidelines that was uh, updated in January last year. We will look a little bit abroad to the other uh, guidelines that are, are, are in the fields, uh, the CAP, uh, the ESMO, et cetera. You, you can recognize already that there is a similarity. So most of these guidelines now recommend to test for not EGFR and ELK only, but test for a broader panel. So in other countries, it's similar. Now, if, it, if a patient biopsy is taken by the pulmonologist and sent to the pathology, what we do is we fix we fixed formula and fix the material, the tissue, and embedded in paraffin, and that's here you see three examples of these tissue blocks. And uh, in the middle uh, one, the resection marked by C, is a, a quite large piece of tumor, uh, tissue I have to say, that was taken from a, uh, from a resection preparation. Uh, but this is not what we have. This is what we normally received from the pathologists from, cancer, from lung cancer patients uh, at, uh, at stage four for which we have to do this testing, the biopsies are much smaller, as indicated in the tissue blocks in, in, uh, marked by A and B. So very tiny slides, tiny tissue. In fact, the pathologist now cuts these, these tissue blocks, and, then, uh, and this is a representative case of what we received to perform molecular testing. So here you see a slide, the pathologist stains this slide, and then you can focus into and determine the amount of neoplastic cells that are needed for the testing. And 5%, which is a very typical amount, it's too low to perform molecular profiling. So the pathologist then indicates in this particular piece, tissue, an area on the right-hand side that has much more neoplastic cells, which are needed for the testing. In fact, we're doing this microdissection of these kind of areas with sufficient neoplastic cells and mostly all the biopsies that we receive at the moment. But you also can appreciate if we have to test, as I mentioned uh, earlier to, uh, in, in, in an earlier slide, all these different markers that we need a lot to do a lot of cutting. And that all has to be done on this small area of tumor cells, uh, of, tu of tumor tissue with the 50% tumor cells. And you can imagine that not for all patients we will be able to do any testing or the complete molecular testing since there is not enough DNA or the number of neoplastic cells is too low or even in, many, in some cases no biopsy can be taken. And this is uh, more than 20% nowadays of the cancer patients from which we received the uh, uh, tissue for molecular profiling. So it's quite, and this number is increasing uh, when the request for more testing comes up. 
So how do we solve that? There are three options to do that. One of them is that well, at least what we do with, uh, in our hospital is discuss immediately this case with the pulmonologist to see whether he can take another biopsy. Because tissue, uh, t having tissue is the best approach to, to get a complete picture of the molecular profile of the patient and so we can give the best uh, therapy advice. In many cases this is not possible. And then we, we have a, also in our lab uh, um, active some uh, non-NGS met methodologies, tests, that require less DNA or less tumor cells, but in the end, we will not be able to have a complete molecular profile. So this is not the perfect uh, solution. Now, the, the, the third solution is to see how we can use plasma liquid biopsies, like plasma cDNA testing in, our, uh, in, our, uh, in, 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 in this procedure. And this is the rest of my talk for today. So here it's indicated we do the molecular profiling mostly on tissue, tissue, on tissue biopsies, but now we're moving to see whether we can use the liquid biopsies as a, uh, as a, as a, a, a tool to do the analysis. And this is not new because it's already part of many international guidelines that, that, uh, that allow to test liquid biopsies when no tissue biopsy is available for, for uh, lung cancer patients. Now let me move into that area. So first, what is a liquid biopsy? Today we talk only about the circulating tumor DNA. So the tumor that grows in the body uh, uh, dies uh, by apoptosis or necrosis, and so tumor parts, tumor components, are, are shedded into the bloodstream of the patient, of, of the person. And so in the, in the bloodstream, then we have, also, in, in addition to the many components, we also have the tumor specific tumor DNA from the patient, which can be used for mutational testing. So now, if we can now take a simple blood uh, drawn from a patient, uh, so here you see an example of a blood uh, tube, and we do a centrifugation step to separate the cell-free plasma fraction in yellow from the erythrocytes and the leukocytes, that cell-free uh, uh, plasma fraction contains uh, uh, many, many components, including the tumor-specific DNA. So we can very easily get uh, our hands on DNA shed it from the tumor, shed it into the bloodstream. However, there are some differences on, uh, on doing this testing on plasma versus if compared to tissue. And I don't have time to go to all of them, but I would like to share with you three which are quite essential. Now first, if we look at the amount of circling tumor DNA, the DNA that comes from the tumor in the bloodstream, compare that to the total amount of DNA that is in the, in, in the, in the plasma fraction, that is less than 1% in most of the cases. In fact, in many cases, it's even less than 0.1%. So the amount of DNA is present in a lot, very large background of other DNA. That's challenge number one. Now then you should realize, and here you see a picture of the amount of patients where we detect uh, cDNA. Uh, when you have patients here of, on the left-hand side picture, there are four, uh, the four, four uh, malignancies. And, and on all these four malignancies, the black bar indicates those patients that have localized disease. And on the open bars, the patients that have metastasized disease, indicating already that if you have metastasized disease, in many, in most of the cases, we identify cDNA. But if you don't have metastasized disease, or less than 50% overall of the patients do not have CT DNA. And this is not only for, for, uh, st for, the, for the metastasizing situation, also if you look at stages of disease, you see a similar pattern, that if you have a higher stage of disease, most of the patients have CT DNA, but if you have a, 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 low, a low, lower stages of disease, stage one for instance, in most malignants we see less than 40% of those, those patients where we can detect using the nowadays available technology, uh, CT DNA. So realize that not all the patients uh, that you see in your practice will have CT DNA for this reason. And finally, and uh, I would like also to share that the, um, the, the size of the DNA that we're looking at, that we, that we take from the bloodstream, is re really very small. It's 160 base pairs. So these are very small fragments. And this is, this is the reason for that is because it's the protected DNA by the, by the nucleosome. That's why it's so small. And in fact, that also means that all the other DNA that is in your, in your bloodstream, so not only from the tumor, but also from the normal cells, has the same size. Uh, this means that we cannot discriminate based on size uh, DNA that comes from the tumor cells versus the non-tumor DNA. Uh, and you can imagine that if you do uh, testing, that you should realize that this small, de detect these small fragments, also your, your analysis should be adapted to that to be able to detect these very small fragments. 
Now, there are a lot of different assays coming into the field, and this is just uh, just a, a, an overview. You can read it in details later. There are many of these kind of reviews that, the, that, that state that you have assays like nitrogen sequencing up to single gene testing that have according to these papers, very high sensitivities and very high specificities in, in, in the situation that it describes. And so to see what is the best assay to be used in, in, in a clinical practice, uh, in, we focused on an, an extra seeding and venue technology on BioRed digital adopted PCR, the COBAS and the UltraSeq four methods I will, that will pass on in the next few slides to see what is best, what would be the best. Now, then, uh, if we could look to the applications that are that are used nowadays uh, for the for molecular diagnostics of lung cancer using plasma-free DNA, these are many, but three of the most important ones are the primary diagnosis, so the detection of predictive markers when the patient comes for the first time when there's no biopsy, monitoring of treatment responses, or the detection of therapy-resistant mechanisms upon progression when the patients are on the treatments. And uh, I'm going to take you to uh, some few examples of these. But the question is, is there one fits all cDNA test that we can use to answer all these questions? And for today's, uh, for today's reasons, I will focus mostly on, uh, on one assay, which is a new technology, a new assay, which is the validation of the Agena mass array-based ultra-seq lung panel as an approach. But before doing that, this is just, don't read it, but this is just an overview of the uh, mutations that can be detected by the Agena UltraSeq lung panel. And in fact, the, 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 the assay detects four, 74 relevant mutations in four genes, in EGFR, KRAS, PIC2CA, and BRAF, so the four genes that are commonly found in lung cancer. Now, the first test that we did uh, to see how this new uh, technology works uh, is a cancer ID study involving three uh, European laborator laboratories that independently from each other tested a same set of samples uh, that were the reference material from Seracare, which carries a couple of different mutations, many mutations. And what we tested is we did every experiment in, the, in, the, in replicate, at least in replicates. The inputs were varied between 5 to 20 nanograms, and we used different allylic frequencies of these uh, mutations. Now, to make a long story short, this is summarized in a simple slide here on the left-hand side, showing the detection rates by the, by, by the different laboratories, uh, the mean uh, by the interlab assessments, that shows that even uh, that, the, that the sensitivity uh, to 1% of the frequency is quite high, it's 100%, but if you go down to 0.5%, still a sensitivity is reached of 91% even uh, in, 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 uh, when using 5 nanograms. So this looks at the sensitivity of this version of the ultraseq test is, quite, uh, is, is, is very, very good. Now next, uh, I would like to take you through the clinical examples, so the clinical applications. And the first of them I would like to join with you is the detection, show, share with you, is the detection of therapy-resistant mechanisms upon progression. Now, you should realize that uh, in, in nowadays diagnostics, already we are using the COBAS, uh, the, the COBAS uh, CT uh, EGFR plasma test, which is an FDA-approved test that was approved in 2017, one of the very few tests, uh, liquid-based by, by, based tests that are available uh, in, uh, nowadays, that is used to detect the T79 mutation, which is a very common mutation that is identified as a resistant mechanisms when treating patients with anti-EGFR therapy. So in about 60% of the cases, uh, after treatment with EGF receptor inhibitors, we see this mutation. And so, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, and so we know that there is now a drug, osimatinib, that was also realized at that time, that, uh, that the, for which the patient responds very well if they have a T79 mutation. So the, com so the companion diagnostic test here is to use CTNA, uh, the COBAS test, with, uh, for treatment decision-making, switching to osimatinib. So this is the goal. But if we look at the new, how it works nowadays, uh, it's a bit more complex, becoming complex. This is because of the new, many new drugs that are coming to the field. On the left-hand slide, you see the resistant mechanisms that we see if we treat the patients with the classical erlotinib and rifitinib uh, anti-EGF receptor to treat uh, drugs. Then the resistant, as I mentioned already, in about 60, uh, more than 60% of the cases, you find the T79 mutation, and that was the reason to treat this patient with osimertinib. Now, if we now have uh, looked to the patients that are treated with osimertinib, all these patients also become resistant to this second drug. 
And in fact, then, if we take a biopsy and look at the sick, at the mutations that we found uh, at, at in those resistant osimertinib treated patients, we found a totally different uh, uh, pattern of, of resistant mutations. Now, not T79 anymore, not EGFR, but many other mutations. Now, this, this drug is so popular that uh, about, year, I think, a year ago now, osimertinib became first-line therapy. So it's the first choice of patients that have an EGF receptor mutation. And we also have first data now on the mutation patterns that we see when in the resistant in the patients that become resistant to osimertinib. And here we see, a, again, a different pattern of mutations. So this means that in nowadays diagnostics in lung cancer for EGFR, and this is not, and I'm not mentioning all the resistant mechanisms for ALK, ROS, MAT, so it's even more complex, the, we cannot look anymore only to uh, the resistant mechanisms for EGFR, so we need other patterns. And there, ultraseq testing comes in, and, and one of the assays that we, one of the studies that we performed is that we compared the ultraseq uh, lung panel with the COBAS EGFR receptor mutation test. And for that, in two laboratories, Montpellier and in Groningen, we selected 137 plasma samples that were already previously tested in the clinical setting with the COBAS test. And we take, took the results from the, from the archives. So these 170, 137 plasma samples were tested. Again, the same samples were tested with the ultra test. And it turns out that the comparison uh, uh, between the, the EGF receptor mutations that are present in both, uh, both panels, the concordance is 74%. So the overall concordance is 86%. But, uh, so that's quite okay, but uh, but in the ultraseq offers, and that's seen on the left-hand slide, the blue marked uh, uh, mutations, are a couple of other important resistant mutations that cannot be detected by the COBOS and can be detected by the ultraseq. So the agreement is okay, but also uh, additional resistant mechanisms can be identified with the ultraseq test. So this means if you now ask, if you now would ask me what is the best assay to use to detect per resistant mechanisms upon progression, I would like to share some aspects that I that you should take into consideration. On the left hand side you have the COBAS test I mentioned, in the middle the ultraseq test, which covers a couple of more genes. On the right hand side, I didn't have time to discuss that, is an, an extra sequencing approach an approach that identifies mutations and seventy seven predictive markers. So it's a very broad coverage, similar to what we do in tissue in the tissue. In, in, in uh, tissue analysis. So, what are the considerations? So, what we, what, what I would suggest is to look at what are the average cost of the test, what are the coverage, how many genes do we detect, how many mutations can be detected, the complexity of the test, time to results, amount of cDNA you used that's needed to do the testing, and then you can appreciate if you look to this summary that I hear, there are many different. So, the next version sequencing approach is quite expensive, but it covers most of the genes, and it is very, but it's very complex, and it takes uh, has high, large high turnaround times. While the ultraseq test is quite cheap, uh, it, you can do it in one day, but you, you do not cover all the resistant mechanisms, all the genes that you like to test. And so these are considerations you should take into account if you have to decide what test pass, fits best in your, in, your, in your laboratory. Now let's move to the primary diagnosis, so the detection of predicted markers in pretreatment plasma samples, in mode, in, particularly in those cases where we don't have a biopsy, uh, uh, don't have tissue to to do predictive testing. Now here we, we, we very recently stu, uh, stu, uh, finished a study, which is not published yet, unpublished data, that we selected a cohort from two laboratories, Groningen and Hamburg, of 72 non-small lung cancer patients. And from these patients, these were treated with tyrosine kinase inhibitors, immunotherapy or chemotherapy, so it was a mix. But from these patients, we selected plasma samples that we had at diagnosis, at first evaluation, so after six weeks, so the first CT scans are done, and at progression. And, now the, and, and, and we used this sample to study several aspects. And the first aspect was uh, for the, all the mutations that were identified by the ultraseq lung panel on any of the plasmas that we tested, so there were, there were 131 different variants across 45 patients. And then we developed um, a, a digital droplet uh, biorad-based assay for each of these different mutations and validated whether there is a, what the agreement was between these tests on the same plasmas. And the concordance was really quite imp impressive. It was more than 90% of the cases were detected by both assays. So this looks fine. Next, what we did is uh, we had a couple of cases, 11 in fact, where we could not find at baseline with the ultraseq a, 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 a variant a mutation, while the tumor that was, we also had data from the, from the original tumor tissue, 
carried a mutation as listed here on this slide. And so what we did is we repeated the testing with the of these negative ultra seq negative cases with the, the highly sensitive digital droplet assay. Uh, and we could find only two in two cases a mutation that was comparable to what we see in the tissue. So in fact, in nine of 11 cases, the ultra seq baseline plasma samples are true negative cDNA negative samples confirmed here by the digital droplet. So the sensitivity, also the clinical sensitivity to be able to, in, in these two samples, is very good for the ultra seq test. Now next, the question was, uh, how does the detection then correlate with the mutation that we already identified previously in the tumor tissue? So what's the concordance between and specifically for the important clinical relevant tumor particle targetable mutations when we compare that uh, with the ultraseq results? And so the overall concordance with the tissue analysis was 79%. So if we now look, and you can see on the left-hand slide on the blue marked area, these are the most clinical relevant mutations that have clinical impact and the concordance becomes even 85 percent so overall it's 79 and becomes even higher if you look at the relevant markers so the relevance is is quite good so to show you how, what what how important how good is this uh, here or how good is this how this compares to other studies we did a study on the left hand slide using natural agent sequencing on plasma samples and compare that also with the data we had from the original tumor and the concordance here by using a broader test was 75%. So the agena in the middle was 79%. And from the literature, there was a study published using the Guardian 360 next agent sequencing approach in lung cancer of unselected cases that, find, that, find an, that found a 81%. And overall, there was a re review already quite old in 2018 published that showed that the overall con concordance by many cancers and many malignancies in many stages is about 70 percent concordance for what you find in the tumor. So that's not 100 percent, but what we found in with the ultraseq is quite comparable or even a little bit better than what we find in general. Uh, a final important remark is for testing is we should always go for uh, a to get a sample from a, from a tissue because the tissue will always give us uh, much more information than any test that we have now in the plasma. Okay, so how can we now use this, uh, this, this liquid-based testing in for, the, for treatment uh, plasma samples to, to determine the diagnosis? Again, here are a couple of options. In case you don't have a biopsy, there's no tissue biopsy, I would suggest to, to go for a broad next generation sequencing panel, although the, it's the long-term amount of time, although it's expensive and complex, but that gives you a quite similar uh, uh, molecular profile as what you would have using the tissue, tissue bi biopsy. Now, you might then use these uh, ultra-seq or other uh, mid-sized panels for pre-screening because it's rapid. You can do the test in one day, and it's very cheap. So it might be an assay that you could put in your, in your implementation project to pre-select cases that can be treat where treatment can be started quite quickly after diagnosis. And finally, we have we, we, we very recently write, written a, a recommendations for a practical implementation uh, with a European group, where based on literature, we also have we have the uh, the idea that parallel sequencing, so doing both the analysis on CFDNA and tumor tissue, re identifies much more patients that are eligible for targeted therapy. So the combination is, is probably also a, a consideration you should you should consider. Now. Let me move to the last example, which is monitoring of treatment responses using changes of plasma mutant levels. So the principle here is that during the treatment, in time, you take blood samples at certain time, time moments, and then based on changes in tumor volume, you, re you, 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 you compare that to changes in the amount of CTNA you can identify in your, in your plasma, an assay that has been published uh, quite often in various uh, educations. So here we have the monitoring treatment responses, again, uh, three di different assays that I would like to illustrate. On the left-hand side is a single gene, very sensitive assay, the BioRed system. In the middle, again, the ultraseq. On the left-hand side, the rush approaches. So let me first start with the ultraseq, which is because monitoring has not been reported using the ultraseq lung panel. On the left-hand side, quite in quite complex picture, I guess, to, to read, but this is just a comparison uh, between the results of, uh, of the allelic frequencies uh, when you use the digital droplet data with the ultraseq normalized data. And, and you can, you can, yeah, hopefully you can see that for breath for e and the T79M EGF receptor mutation, the results are very comparable. So it's a linear co comparison. 
Now, but more importantly, can you use this now to to identify patients that uh, that uh, that uh, during progression that do better or not? And here I show you the overall survivals, the the the, 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 the of of the overall survival and the. Uh, uh, of, the, of the of patients that were treated uh, from this population, I showed you of 661 six, non-smoking patients treated with both transient inhibitors and immunotherapy. And you can uh, appreciate here on this picture that the blue line is is the line in, survi in the survival curves that shows a decrease of the number of uh, of uh, cDNA when you compare the baseline sample with the sample after six weeks. So a decrease shows a much better survival for the patients, uh, either treated with uh, EGFR, with, uh, with tyrosine kinase inhibitors or immunotherapy, while patients that do a decrease, do not show this decrease, do worse. So this shows that monitoring, uh, monitoring response, uh, the ultraseq is an assay that can be used for that. So if we now compare that to other assays on the left-hand side, based on a single-based biorad assay, where we used the digital droplet PCR uh, of the mutation that was identified previously on the tissue of the tumor of that specific patient. Do you see a similar pattern again if you see the decrease in six weeks after treatment uh, levels in the, in the plasma? The, these patients do much better in the overall survival curves. And we also did a very large study that was very pu published last month uh, using the Divino uh, CTNA National Seeding Assay. Similar approach again, but here we sequenced both the baseline as well as the six weeks after treat after start treatment assay. And again, we can recognize quite clearly that we can identify patients that do best, do better, when you still can measure the decrease. So this, I think, is an is an important evolution and, and uh, uh, achievement that it can be used. In diagnostics, but again, uh, sorry, go on my back. But again, this slide illustrates that, it, for me at least, there is at this moment not a particular assay that that would be preferred. It's really depending on uh, what the stage of of your season, how it fits into your clinical setting. So to end up, few uh, a few comments, final comments. It's, I, I guess I I try to show you that it's a very promising diagnostic tool to use circling tumor DNA in a cell-free plasma fraction. You can easily take blood. It's it's not it's very few no, less an invasive assay. The logistics are quite simple. Can be introduced in routine pretty easily. It's not very expensive, and I think Masray uh, the Masray based panel that's what I try to show you today is also one of the players that can be can be used in uh, these uh, these kind of testing. Now and here's my my last slide. Uh, summarizing uh, uh, some of the aspect take-home message, I would say. So what I talk about today, and this is the complex slide on, on, the, on uh, uh, that you see on the, on the on the on the higher part of this of the slides, that we talked about CTNA testing today. But you should realize that the whole workflow of using liquid biopsy immunological diagnostic starts already when you collect your DNA, up until uh, interpretation and reporting. Uh, the results for the clinicians. And there are many, many steps that need uh, a lot of attention, a lot of harmonization and standardization. And I think we should take the chance because changing the world of testing and tissue, it's quite hard because everybody is doing that for many years already, but here we have a chance to standardize these technologies. And there are quite various obvious uh, uh, option opportunities being going on. In the Netherlands, we have a consortium doing that, but there are some larger consortiums going on in Europe and, and in the States as well. I also hope to show you that there is no one fits all uh, CDNA test that we can use for all the to answer all the diagnostic applications. And I even didn't talk today about the early population screening detection or early detection of risk progression, which needs a very high sensitive uh, CDNA tests, which are which is again another another challenge. Now, finally, clinical utility is mostly lacking. That means we need prospective studies. Uh, to show that the, all these technologies that we're describing can be implemented in diagnostics and have clinical purpose, and that's important. There are not many of these studies, so we should focus in the very near future to set up these kind of studies. Now, finally, I talked about a lot of things. I didn't talk about important challenges. I would just want to mention here very briefly about the cost-effectiveness. Reimbursements are not arranged in many countries. I think centralization of the complexity of the complex testing is needed and quality, quality control and quality testing and assessments of plasma and cDNA testing. I didn't point that out, but that's also very important to take part of that. Now, let me show you here the slide of the people who were involved at least in some of the studies that I showed you today. And with that, I thank you for your attention, and I will give the work back to Bob. Thank you very much. 
Dr. Schering, thank you very much, and do pay some attention to this uh, wonderful team uh, that stands behind Dr. Sherry and his important work in the Netherlands. Remember, uh, at any time, you can type in comments and questions in the question and answer box, and we'll get to those following our final presentation, which will be queued up now. And that presentation will be given by Dr. Daryl Irwin. He's a PhD, and he's the Vice President of Scientific Affairs at Agena Bioscience. Dr. Irwin. Thank you, Bob. And thank you, Professor Schering, for your uh, presentation and the interesting data that you, you shared with us. It's been a pleasure for, for us to work with you and your team at, uh, at, at Groningen, um, Ed, and we look forward to further collaborations and delivering more data together. So today I'm going to update you on uh, some information about the gene of bioscience, particularly as we are launching a new version of all of our oncology products, um, including our liquid biopsy products over the course of the next two weeks. So I can give you some performance characteristics and other details on those products. Agena uh, is a global company, just like this webinar. So based in, in, in San Diego, in California, but also with offices not far from Professor Schuring uh, in, in the Netherlands, being in Hamburg, Germany, an office in Shanghai, China, and where I come to you from today, Brisbane, Australia. Agena's mission is to provide affordable, targeted genomic testing um, to clinical laboratories across the world. And we do that using the Mass Array instrument, which is the instrument that you can see in front of you. It is a desktop Malditoff mass spectrometer um, with a liquid handling station on the right-hand side uh, that delivers a variety of different applications. So as I mentioned, we are launching a new version of all of our UltraSeq panels. Um, that, that version two will be launched uh, by the end of this month. and. Uh, we have done a thorough uh, redesign and revalidation of all of these panels. So we've done in silico ver verification of the primer design to ensure accuracy of the target. We've then done a limit of detection study for each assay that's in each of the panels. And we've done that using a synthetic oligonucleotide, um, which can be quantified uh, by digital PCR and then spiked into a wild type DNA background at known frequency so that we can determine the limit of detection in that model system. If there were poor performing assays, that we've redesigned those to improve the sensitivity and the specificity, and then done full functional testing. And we've also included in this panel, uh, the verification includes uh, DNTP and a DNTP-DUTP mixture with uh, UNG to, in order to control uh, carryover contamination, which is very important when you're looking at, at, at assays that have these sorts of levels of sensitivity. So in our verification study, we observed 100% specificity across all of the panels. And then uh, the sensitivities of the panels uh, are on your screen. So for, for example, uh, we've, for the ultrasonic EGFR panel, we've got 100% sensitivity at less than or equal to 0.5%. Again, similar with lung. And what you can see in, in there is you can also see the breakdown. So for the ultrasonic lung panel, which is the one that we have been focusing on today, um, in today's presentation. 71% uh, of the assays were, were had a limit of detection of 0.125%, 17% of the assays at 0.25, and then 9 and 3% at 0.5 and 1% respectively. So, so you can see the vast majority of our assays are, are, are well below 0.5% uh, and reaching all the way down to 0.1%, as Professor Shuring also showed in his data. We also did a thorough interlaboratory uh, performance test. And, and again, when we send these kits and, and materials out to various different laboratories across the globe, we're achieving high levels of sensitivity and specificity. In this study, we're using reference standards from Ciricare at 1% and 0.5%, as well as those synthetic uh, titrated in standards at 0.5 and 0.25%. The software comes with a brand new, uh, sorry, the, the, the applications come with a brand new reporting software um, being our somatic variant reporter. 
So this somatic variant reporter is a universal HTML-based reporter that actually brings all of our oncology panel reporting under a single software umbrella. So this, this same format is used for our UltraSeq, our IFLEX HS panels, as well as our ClearSeq, ClearSeq panels. Now, the HTML format is very nice for the user and very nice to the eye, but it's not particularly useful for a limb system. So the output is also generated in a, in a comma-separated values file format such that you can, you can put it directly into your limb system uh, for, for automated reporting. The user can modify the thresholds when they bring up the report. The report actually recognises the, 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 the assays and the data that's on the plate and it identifies which panel is being run and it brings up the default thresholds for that panel that are the Agena um, derived default thresholds. Now the user at this point can modify it and if the user does wish to permanently use modified settings for analysis, they can save that into the the default settings file such that it always brings up their particular settings in just in case uh, if, if for example our laboratory was to validate the test on alternative settings. So this is the output of the somatic variant reporter here and uh, this is for example a Syracad 2.5 percent standard. So first of all you get the QC status uh, so that is passed and if it hasn't passed you'll get a variety of different QC messages as to what the issues observed were. Um, the, the location of the sample on the plate, uh, because many of these are multi-well panels, so you can click on that and it identifies all of the wells that's been utilised to call that particular, that particular sample. Then we have a list of the variants that are detected. So you can see, for example, uh, here we've got a KRAS uh, protein change G12C coding change 34G to T variant that was detected in this sample. Nice strong Z score there of uh, almost 12 and, and the calculated uh, variant allele frequency and, and confidence interval is, is, is reported. When you hover over that, it then brings up a pop-up box as well uh, because this particular mutation was detected by two separate assays in the panel being a primer that's extending in the forward direction and a primer that's extending in the reverse direction. So it's those two assays that, that, that are used to confirm this mutation and, and, and the details for each of those assays, including the Z-score, the variant allele frequency, the well on the plate and the plate that's being utilised. And you can see there are several other um, mutations in this sample as well that are all listed in the table. It does also confirm the number of variants that were not detected um, and, and, and if there were any indeterminate variants. Indeterminate variants are examples of where we do have uh, redundant assays that are detecting a variant and they've given conflicting results that will be, be reported as an indeterminate variant. Or if you've had a, if you've had a QC issue in running the panel, um, any, any, any mutations that are in the wells that have failed QC will then be reported as indeterminate. Okay, so we had the great pleasure to work with Garden, uh, Garden, Garden Health on a study in KRAS uh, protein change G12C in advanced non-small cell lung cancer. Now this study was actually the Code Break 100 study, which was the clinical study that was utilised to, uh, to, to approve the companion diagnostic for Lumicras, the breakthrough therapy for KRAS G12C um, pro, uh, patients carrying KRAS G12C mutations. So in this study, we had 213 cell-free DNA uh, samples from, from patients. Uh, the, the, the Agena UltraSeq Lung version 2 panel, that is the one that is launching very shortly, was, was selected as the comparator method in this, in this clinical CDX study. So in the 213 patients, um, we, we, we had uh, a very high concordance, uh, so we had a 96% positive predictive uh, agreement and 94% negative predictive agreement. So you can see 102% positive on both technologies, sorry, 102 samples positive on both technologies, 101 samples negative on both technologies. So very, very high concordance there. But of course, there's 10 samples that were discordant. Um, and, and I'd like to focus on, on those 10 samples. The, so those discordant samples, in six of the 10, they were positive on the gardens and negative on the agena. 
And in four of the 10, they were negative on the garden and positive on the, on the agena. So no particular technology bias here. And then when we look at the data that, that, that was reported, and we can, what we can see is that, in fact, all 10 of them are very close to, or they have amounts of circulating tumor DNA that are very close to the limit of detection of both technologies. And in fact, what we're observing here is simple stochastic noise. When you're at the limit of detection based on sampling error, because you are taking, taking an aliquot of the sample and putting it into a particular technology, based on sampling error, you can be slightly below or slightly above the limit of detection uh, of, for that aliquot that's, that's been sampled. And that's exactly what, uh, what is occurring here. So very high concordance, and we were very pleased to be involved in, 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 in this study um, because, of course, Lumacras is, uh, is, is a significant improvement in options for advanced non-small lung cancer patients. So with, uh, in fact, with Professor Shuring and with all of the, the um, Cancer ID Consortium, we will, or a number of members of the, the Cancer ID Consortium, we, we did a study looking at the precision of that, of, of that determined variant allele frequency um, which is a feature of the ultraseq technology, but also a feature of, very, uh, of, of a number of other technologies, including digital PCR and next generation sequencing. So we're use, using uh, Seracare standards here again at known, known variant frequency with a variety of different mutations. Uh, uh, we, we ran those across different technologies, being those digital PCR technologies the ultra-seq chemistry and next generation sequencing, several different versions of next generation sequencing. If I cut to the chase, in fact, across all technologies, it was ultra-seq that showed the lowest CV um, in the quantitative measurements, both in intra-run in the gray and inter-run in the blue, um, with, with uh, a CV of, of, of nine and 10% respectively, which, which, which in fact, was slightly below the shot noise um, or the or the or the statistically expected um, a sampling error, showing that we're not introducing any further technical error uh, outside of uh, that expected sampling error. So this was this was a a, a study that showed that the UltraC can deliver very highly quantitative data. So our, our panels that we are releasing uh, for the, in, in, in the version two suite, uh, we have our EGFR panel, which is six clinically relevant panels in EGFR, the three common driving mutations and the three common resistance mutations being T790M and two versions of C797S for monitoring of, of, of EGFR uh, TKI therapy. The, ultra, the broader ultra-seq lung panel, a mid-density panel covering five genes, BRAF, EGFR, ERBV2, KRAS, and PIK3CA, with 74 clinically relevant mutations that we've talked about today uh, and, and has been shown in all of Professor Shuring's data. We also have the ultra-seq colon panel. Um, this is five genes, BRAF, EGFR, KRAS, NRAS, and PIK3CA. So it has very broad KRAS, NRAS um, uh, content, as you would expect for a colorectal cancer panel. Uh, B BRAP, of course, is included in PIK3CA. And the EGFR mutations, unlike the lung panel where they're down in the tyrosine kinase domain, uh, or, or, or uh, in the kinase domain, I should say, the EGFR receptors here are at the, at the cell surface or, 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 or up, in the, up in the cell receptor area um, because these are resistance mutations to EGFR blockade. Then we also have our ultraseq melanoma panel 13 genes with more than 60 clinically relevant mutations. Very broad coverage in BRAF and a variety of other, other, other relevant genes for, for melanoma. And if these, these off-the-shelf panels don't, don't meet your need, um, they, we, we also have our assays via GINA custom laboratory services. And day in, day out, we create custom assays across all of our applications, including the ultraseq um, chemistry, so that you can have an assay that meets your lab's unique needs. So do contact us um, if, 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 our, if our panel menu uh, doesn't meet what you're looking for because we can, we can deliver exactly what you need. So the mass array uh, system is a mid-density um, analyzer for targeted actionable mutations, uh, analyzing anywhere from tens to hundreds of genetic markers with easy to interpret results. Um, on, onboard software, single click reporting into HTML and CSV formats 
that happens almost instantaneously with no no uh, complex bioinformatics. It's cost effective, at a, running at a cost of $10 to $100 per sample. Um, this is based on the UltraSeq pricing. Different applications uh, have, have different chemistries and generally are, are, are lower. Uh, but uh, this, this delivers the lowest price per sample with high levels of multiplexing of most technologies on the market. Very efficient workflow with single day workflow uh, from sample to result, and it's customizable. We've talked about the liquid biopsy solutions today, but we also have tumor profiling solutions, pharmacogenomic solutions, inherited diseases, and infectious diseases um, in, in our menu, all that get run on the same instrument, and the vast majority of which can actually be run on the same chip, making it a highly versatile tool for the molecular pathology laboratory. So with that, I'd like to thank Professor Schuring um, and, and, and thank our audience for joining us today. And I will hand the seminar back to Bob. Dr. Irwin, thank you very much. Uh, we're close uh, to our close here, but we have a few minutes. If we don't get a chance to pose your question, I'm going to share them with Agena. And between Agena and ourselves, uh, I think we'll get your question answered in due course, if not today. I did want to start with a very interesting question that I'm sure many in the audience have. Um, and I'll ask you first, Dr. Schuring. Uh, and it is as follows. Do the data sets that you have seen and worked with offer any suggestions as to how often a patient undergoing treatment should be monitored for mutation detection? Oh. Uh. Oh, that's a difficult question. Um, yes. um, I mean, um, I think now at this moment we are um, we, we do a CT scan after six weeks, which is routine. You cannot do that earlier, and I think that this this CTNA testing uh, offers opportunities to test earlier than the six weeks uh, um, to, to get an impression already early. Uh, at, immediately after start of the treatment, whether you should really progress or not. So the data that I show you were on patients treated with immunotherapy, and there it might really be worthwhile to already uh, long before six weeks have an indication whether the patient is going to be uh, uh, responding or not. So, um, so the monitoring should be done not only at six weeks, but preferably uh, be before CT scanning. Uh, but I can, and we don't have time to do that, but also those patients that respond well, I think later uh, monitoring might also be okay. So uh, the answer is much more than once, of course. Yes, thank you very much. And Dr. Irwin, would you care to add some comment on that as to uh, how the data suggests frequency of testing for mutations? Yeah, sure. So, well, the study design is, is, is a challenge. Uh, we would love to take uh, samples on a daily basis once patients are initiated on therapy and really have a, have a detailed time course of many of these patients. Um, but we do need to work in with what the, what the clinical scenario is. And as Professor Shearing said, you know, the patient is coming in at six weeks for a CT scan. So that becomes an ideal point to, to, to collect a blood draw. If there is anyone in the audience that would like to do studies with more a higher frequency, then please do let us know. I'd be very interested in doing that. Very good. And I have one more final question, and it's a, it's a very interesting one, so I want to be sure and get it in. It will probably be our last question, just so you know. Uh, and it has, really has to do with how these uh, great detection methods are changing the way tests are ordered and used. I'll ask you first, Dr. Schuring. Uh, given the fact that the standardization and proven utility of liquid biopsy is now established, what are your thoughts on the impact of clinical decision maker, makers and makers? I mean, in other words, who orders the test? Does this technology target the pulmonologist or the general care physician, or are we still largely dealing with medical oncologists and thoracic surgeons? Dr. Schering. Yeah, I believe that the, the pulmonologist is the is the first uh, uh, doctor who uh, not only who sees the patients for the first time and has to has to of course to decide uh, whether the whether the patients are dealing with cancer or not before any data. So 
I believe not, not the GP, but uh, also not the medical oncologist, at least for lung cancer, but the pulmonologist has keeps a central role in deciding what should be done. It makes life easier, as I, as I proposed in one of my slides, that probably mm -hmm. we should do both testing. So both tissue testing, which takes a long, long, somewhat more time because the biopsy will be taking a few days or sometime a week after di first diagnosis is set. CT scans you need to wait for, but the plasma test can be done already quite quickly uh, and gives you, since it's cheap, it gives you already an impression at the time you get your data on CT scanning and, uh, and tissue uh, molecular profiling. Very good. And Dr. Irwin, the same question. I'm assuming uh, there's some there's some uh, national and, and country differences in how the tests are ordered, but would you care to comment on how this may be changing patterns of test ordering in these for these patients? Yeah, it, well, it certainly varies in in different countries, Bob. Um, both the, the the setup of the medical system and and who's ordering the test and who's interpreting the test, but also which tests are ordered based on 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 approvals and reimbursements in in, mm -hmm. in different countries. Um, but in this country, we follow a very similar situation to the Netherlands, where the pulmonologist is is central. Very good, thank you. I'll give you with that the last word and then begin to uh, wrap up. I want to thank Dr. Ed Schuring of the Groningen Medical Center in the Netherlands, and I want to once again applaud him for his great patience and forbearance with us in our use of sharing his slide. It was an incredibly good presentation, and you will be able to see that in about a week at capttodayonline.com. Well done, Dr. Schuring. Also, I want to thank Daryl Irwin for a terrific presentation on the AGENA platform and some interesting, interesting results in comparative studies. I, of course, want to thank AGENA Bioscience. Their special educational grant uh, helped us, uh, enabled us to put this on today, and they were incredibly helpful in putting this program together, so we're happy to present that. Once again, I want to thank all of you in the audience who've taken time from a very busy schedule, I know, to attend today's webinar. And uh, with that, I'll begin to wrap up with thanks once again to Dr. Shearing, Dr. Irwin, Agena Bioscience, and all of you in the audience. Thank you very much. And with that, I'll bring this webinar to a close.